Hello, everybody. Um, hang on a minute. I've just lost Josh. There we go. You're back. Cool. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, good Sunday morning. If you're in New Zealand, Australia, if you're in the US, then good Saturday night, I think it is. <laughs> yep. Uh, so today I have, um, we're very lucky, we have a very special guest, Josh Bouton, who's the founder uh, and creator of Rooted Nutrition in New York, and he is going to um, give us some some really awesome insights into the organic and natural health and supplement industry. Um, if you guys have any questions throughout the webinar, if you scroll down onto the question uh, bar just below input your questions there and we will get to answer them at the end of every little section So please type in stuff if you want to ask Josh any of your questions, but I'm going to get started straight away because we have a lot to cover So I thought we'd start by uh, Josh if you want to just introduce yourself Tell us a little bit about your background your experience um, within the natural health and supplement industry uh, a little bit about rooted nutrition and um, and why why you're here why you why do you do what you do with with regards to supplements why are you not working in a big corporation making millions of dollars well hello everyone as he said uh my name's josh um i am the co-founder with my wife of rooted nutrition um a health and wellness company located in new york um, I've been in the natural products industry for a little over 19 years now, um, since I was 17 years old, when I got my first job at a health food store, I thought I was just going to be stocking shelves. But my third day there, they made me the supplement person, and I knew nothing about supplements. And that's kind of how I got started. Since then, I have trained with Native American herbalists, medicine men in Mexico, and shamans in Ecuador. I am actually a certified master herbalist. I do consulting for supplement companies uh, and stores. We help them deal with regulatory compliance, issues surrounding product formulation, quality control, that sort of thing. Um, I have worked in multiple and run multiple health food stores and I have worked in integrative pharmacy. Um, so I've kind of done the whole gamut from seeing the product on the shelves at the health food store to being in the lab and the manufacturing facility to visiting fields in India and other places and actually eating the crops right out of the field. So I have a breadth of experience and knowledge in all parts of the industry. I'll just put my thing back on. So, I mean, you've been around for a long time and this is, I mean, I'm talking to you, I'm always really inspired and I love hearing all your stories because you have so many stories to tell. Um, <laughs> But I really wanted to get your take and I want people to hear about how you feel that the natural health and supplement industry has changed. Because when you started 19 years ago, it was really in its infancy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, uh, the organic sector in New Zealand has just exploded over the last 10 years. And so has our natural supplement and health industry. Our organic sector is worth half a billion dollars a year, which for New Zealand is quite substantial now. Mm -hmm. um, what's changed since you started? Well, a lot's changed. Um, you know, in the last 19 years, the industry has changed from one that was mostly mom and pop, kind of small companies making unique products, really caring about people's health, to one that's owned by big corporations and distributors and, and chains and Amazon and things like that. And they care far more now about marketing and margins and you know how many units can we sell it doesn't even come up how is this going to improve someone's health so i would say the industry has changed completely into one that's mostly focused on marketing and margins with that change obviously there's been a, ch a change in the way consumers are buying there's also a, a change in the way that you know companies are, are marketing to us who in in regards to, I don't know if you know much about the New Zealand industry, but in the U.S., who are the big players in this, and how is how has big money got into this system? Because they've started to see an appeal in it. They mm -hmm. realize hey, there's more, there's big bucks to be made here. So, to, uh, tell us about some of the big companies that have got involved in this process um, and trying to cash in on things. Sure. I, I mean, you have big players that are well known, such as um, Whole Foods, which is a chain of stores that's owned by Amazon. Um, and they're the largest kind of retail presence in the natural products industry. And then you have the companies 
that distribute to them like UNFI. So they're the people that bring a lot of the products in the trucks to the stores. And then, um, and then you have companies like Nestle and General Mills and, and Kellogg and Hain and Pepsi and all of these Campbell's Soup, all these big companies who actually own most of the brands that are sold in health food stores and natural food stores in the U.S., but they market them in a way that people don't really realize who actually owns them. Um, you know, you can have, all, you know, you see all these signs that say non-GMO and we care about people. And then you see them selling products that are owned by Nestle who uses slave labor in the Ivory Coast in Ghana. And so it becomes very hard to take that seriously. You mentioned, you, we would never suspect that they were in behind a lot of the natural health industry. Do, do you reckon they purposely uh, try to keep their name out of it in, in order, it's, we say like the wolf in sheep's clothing, mm -hmm. in order for us to, to feel like, because we know, if I saw a product by Nestle um, or, Pep, you know, Pepsi now make kombucha, you know, <laughs> but it's not under the label of Pepsi, it's under the label of something else. Mm -hmm. You reckon that's an intentional move that they do to try and greenwash uh, what, they're, what they're trying to do in the industry and bring, uh, you know, to, for sales purposes, et cetera? Oh, absolutely. Because a lot of the people who want natural products and want healthier things are in general not fans of those companies. So they try and hide it as best they can. Um, and they're very good at it. I mean, these are companies that spend billions every year just in marketing. So they will spend a couple million dollars just coming up with a name and an image for a label and think nothing of it because they know how much they're going to sell it. They greenwash it and cover it up. Few examples. I'm actually going to share a screen. I'm going to try and see if we can do this. But you sent me through some um, some examples here. Um, so let me know if you guys can see this screen. Is that showing up? Uh, not yet. There we go. Uh, get rid of that. <laughs> Is okay. Are we? Are we? Can you see this? Uh, it's just black. Okay. Hang on. We should we should have tried to iron out these technical difficulties <laughs> before. Um, application window. Ah, Chrome tab. That's what I want. I want to show you. The first webinar that we're doing, there's always going to be a few hiccups, but as we go on, we'll get them under control. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is that working? Yes. Yeah. That is the who owns a lot of the vitamin companies. Yeah. And so I was shocked when you sent this through to me because some of these companies we know in New Zealand, I mean, there's Nestle under um, Atrium Innovations, Clorox, who produced bleach originally, <laughs> have decided to get on, on the industry. But Amway is actually the owner of Metagenics and Neutralife. They own a large share of Metagenics and they own Neutralite. Yep. Um, Pfizer, I knew about this one. Pfizer have their label of Centrum, and we have Centrum mm -hmm. here in New Zealand. So that's mm -hmm. a pharmaceutical owned brand and company. Um, we've got Bayer, Shift, Eye Health, um, and there was another one down here that was. Uh, so Nutraceutical would be one of the biggest players in the U.S. market. Um, the the top players now are actually um, Clorox and Nestle with their brands, uh, and NTBY are the big three. And a lot of people who shop in health food stores are of the more liberal persuasion. I'm not sure that they would be super happy about that. Um, NTBY, one of their largest investors, which is nature's, which is NTBY is the nature's bounty, is the Carlisle group, which is the Saudi royal family and the bushes and the weapons and things like that. So that also has a nice <laughs> presence in supplements. Wow. And and what about in New Zealand here? You, you said you had some information on our, our supplement mm -hmm. industry. Um, yeah, so there are. Well. I don't have a chart yet, but there are, for example, Swiss Wellness is a big brand in New Zealand and yeah. that's owned by a Chinese firm. You know, Nature's Care is another big brand, which is owned by several Chinese investment corporations. Vitapro mm -hmm. Brands, which does... Uh, Healtheries, Neutralife, Wagner, a whole bunch of other ones. Um, Go Healthy is another brand that um, yeah. is the Better Health Company, which was recently bought out. Very few of them that I could find were actually New Zealand-owned companies. 
Yeah, and the interesting Go Healthy, I think, is one of our biggest now in New Zealand. And that when was that sold? That was sold a few years back to a yeah, Chinese. Yeah, I don't, I don't have the exact date on that. I don't want to give. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't it, know exactly. But it was they were done by our Commerce Commission because they they had on the label New Zealand made, um, and the thing was it was you know a hundred percent non New Zealand ingredients for most of the products that they produce. Um, and then they um, they had to change the label because the Commerce Commission said, well, it's false advertising and marketing. But, it, it, you know, like when we look at a lot of the range of these supplements, they're, they're majority of them come from, from, from China or from the Asian area. And most of the companies now are not owned by New Zealand, New Zealanders at all. It's, most of it's Chinese owned. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanted to bring that up as an example. You had a there's you said there's only a handful of companies that are actually New Zealand owned and yes. manufacturing. Yeah. Um, yeah. One was called Good Health Naturally, for example. Another one yeah. was LifeStream, uh, Pure Vitality, yeah. Douglas Pharmaceuticals, that, who makes a vitamin line. Those four were New Zealand owned. It doesn't mean all the raw materials come from New Zealand. It just means the company is yeah. physically owned by people in New Zealand. Well, we don't, the problem here, we don't really have the raw materials. And I think this is one of the biggest issues, but I want to get on to talking about the Chinese organics because, or, or Chinese ingredients, because this is really something that is becoming more and more relevant as the, the world demand goes up for, um, for organics. Obviously we, we cannot supply enough to the people that want it. Mm -hmm. um, as the world demand goes up for the for supplements, we can't manufacture on those scales. So this is where China has come in and and taken that place in the industry. Um, but it comes with its pros and cons. So from your experience in the U.S., I think you guys have far more experience with Chinese organics than we do here. It's quite a new thing in New Zealand, or or Chinese made supplements. What are your What do you think the pros and cons are of this model? Um, from so, a consumer perspective, really. So one thing I like to get, I like to say up front, because I've had this said a few times to me, this really isn't about the Chinese people. And, and, and this is not a racist <laughs> thing. This this is really has to do with the, the fascist Chinese government and the things that they do, the way they incentivize things and the way they rule by fear or disappearing people. It, it has nothing to do with the Chinese people or their culture. So you know, I really like to make that clear that this really is because of the Chinese government. Um, so mm -hmm. no, no country is perfect. You can get adulterated or bad raw materials from any country. So I don't want people to think that it's a uniquely Chinese issue. But the vast majority of adulterated or contaminated ingredients, products, and raw materials come from China. I mean, that's simply a fact. And... It, other than scale, I can't really think of any pros because if you actually <laughs> dig into any part of it, it's not good. Um, you know, one of the things people say, oh, well, they can do it cheaper. They do it cheaper because you have either massive government subsidies or externalizing the environmental costs. It's a lot cheaper to run a factory where you can, you can just dump all the effluent into the river right next door. So mm -hmm. you, there, I, there really aren't pros to doing it when you dig anything below surface level. And I, I noticed on your website, you're you're 100 percent China free when it comes to ingredient supplements and those types of things. And you pride yourself on that. Like I, when you click on a product, it has the label <laughs> China free. We and we are working to be China free, but, you know, I don't want to say that we're 100 percent there yet, because sometimes certain companies uh, will change a raw material supplier and we don't catch it right away. That's why we're yeah. working to not just become China free, but become 100 percent sort of farm slash raw material to bottle. That's kind of the model that we're moving yeah. towards, because that's a better goal than just being China free. Um, um, do you have any examples specifically around the, the the safety side of things as well? Because I think that's one of my biggest concerns was when I watched, I mean, I watched the, the rotten series about the Chinese garlic 
being mm-hmm. you, you know using um, slave labor in prisons, for example, is a really good uh, one on that. But there were some other really scary uh, stories that I've heard about um, heavy metal contamination, chromium, cadmium, these types of things. Like, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, do you have any examples that you've you've come across in which safety is a big issue out of China? Sure. I mean, a lot of products, especially herbal supplements that come out of China or herbal raw materials, heavy metals are are through the roof. But sometimes there's much scarier things than than heavy metals. We think of lead as as being really bad and 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 they are. I'm not saying that lead isn't bad, but there are, for example, for years, um, chondroitin, which is a raw material used in a lot of joint supplements, like people buy glucosamine, chondroitin, that kind of stuff. Chondroitin had a contaminant that no one could figure out what it was. They just called it peak X. It took many, many years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop a test to determine what that was. And it was something called Calgan, an industrial solvent that's incredibly unhealthy to ingest, Mm -hmm. but no one could figure out what it is. And yep. it took one company who really cared about that particular issue to, to step in and, and do that. But the problem is, and, and Rotten went into this in the Honey episode in, on Netflix, which yeah. is the first episode, they developed new ways of adulteration and cheating tests faster than we can come up with new tests. Because it takes years and years to develop, as you know, as a biochemist, to develop Mm. new testing methods and and reactants and regents and things like that. Whereas I can come up with a new adulterant tomorrow, put it in an herb and it would pass half the companies in the US quality control. Even though it it looked strange on an HPLC because they didn't know what it was, half of them would pass it. And so that is a huge problem. There's things that end up in this stuff that we don't even know what it is at the moment, illegal pesticides, Um, a lot of bilberry, for example, that comes out of China, isn't even bilberry. It's, it's red band amaranth food dye, which is incredibly carcinogenic. Um, black soybean holes and Chinese, Chinese black soybean holes and charcoal. And that's what they pass off as bilberry. And so (laughs) there are all kinds of, you know, you have a lot of turmeric powder that comes out of China now that has a, a very dangerous dye in it called mentanil yellow, which, which is a carcinogen. I, I mean, I could talk for an hour about all the different <laughs> things. Yeah. That I mean, we've, we've seen this, uh, you know, in the marker industry as well. Like we've seen adulterated powders. And I think the problem is when we, I don't think consumers realize the process, like to import and use these kinds of powders, um, you know, they, they don't pass very strict uh, quality control testing. For example, you know, like it's really just does it contain bacteria they are going to kill you, mm-hmm. like salmonella, E. coli, etc. Does it look like the powder should look? You know, does it have mm-hmm. that? And, and you don't need to send it away to a lab to analyze, uh, uh, for example, an elemental analysis to prove that that is exactly what it should be. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you get onto more complex blends, you know, where it's herbal extracts, where it's not just vitamin C, for Mm -hmm. example, this is where it gets complicated because, you know, how do you ensure the quality of that product? Mm -hmm. Uh, And without the traceability and the trust, there's huge issues with that. Um, What do you think is some of the, so I know that in the U S there's been a big uh, movement towards China free, like you, you guys have done. Uh, which is really interesting. And Rotten did a great piece on this. If you guys don't know Rotten, it's a documentary series on Netflix. Really, really eye-opening documentary series about the food industry. Uh, every time I watch an episode, I'm just my mind blowing. You know, it's really like, good. They did a really good job with it. Yeah. So with this, um, there, there's, you know, people are, are getting catching on, and they're saying, how do we? Uh, you know, I don't want Chinese ingredients. I don't want this and that. But China has figured out ways to get around this. So can you talk about this uh, idea you said before of uh, what was the word with where they're exporting? Transshipping. Yeah, I want I want people to know more about transshipping. Sure. So, yeah. So this also was in the Netflix rotten honey thing. I We don't work for Netflix or get money from Netflix. They just did a really good job. So 
Uh, it's not often yeah. the case when series like that are done so well. But transshipping is where, it, let's say a country has a tariff on it or some kind of import and export restrictions, they will ship it to another country, label it as coming from that country, and then ship it out. So mm -hmm. you'll have, for example, honey, and I put this in quotes, coming from China that's banned in certain places, it gets sent to, let's say, Vietnam. It's labeled as then coming from Vietnam and then is shipped to the U.S. saying mm -hmm. product of Vietnam when it was actually from China. Um, and, and how do they get away with this? Like, do they buy a factory in Vietnam to do it? Or like, what is, how do they avoid those those you know compliance things. Oh, you just issues. pay a, you just pay a guy off at the docks or a couple government officials, or you just <laughs> label it as Vietnam and they don't really check it because they don't care. Um, mm -hmm. Usually, it yeah. just involves giving someone some money because a lot of these products that are being transshipped are, are adulterants or not even what they say they are. Like a lot of honey is just corn syrup. So let's say yeah. you corn syrup costs nothing to produce. Um, so let's say you ship. 10 batches of that corn syrup that you're labeling as honey to Vietnam, seven get confiscated. You don't care because you made a ton of money off the first batch. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's just a numbers game. They just run enough through till eventually something gets through. Yeah. So there's yeah. a variety of ways. It, it's really interesting. And I'll come back to the transshipping because I'm going to talk about it with Maka. Um, but <clears throat> with regards to superfoods, this is something we're really interested in. And um, you, you've, d you've done a lot of research and, and investigation into this, which is, I think you said to me, like you knew never stocked maca until you met us. Cause you didn't trust or something that you, or with cacao as well. You just didn't trust it. Yeah, uh, we, we didn't, I didn't really do maca. I mean, it might've been an ingredient in one thing or something, but we didn't do maca because of the Chinese mafia issue. Um, yeah. And, so do you want to that, know, this is it's, it's sounding like a Hollywood movie, but do you do you want to talk us through this Chinese mafia story? Because I think this is really interesting and compelling. When you sent me the info on this, um, you know, I couldn't believe it. We did more investigation in Peru about this mm -hmm. and, it, you know, more and more stories we heard from from the locals up there. It was shocking. The whole thing was yeah. shocking. Um. <laughs> So um, maca is, you can talk more about this, but maca is a heritage crop in Peru. It's illegal to take the, like, the bulbs or seeds out that you can replant mm -hmm. somewhere else because it's a heritage crop. So um, demand around the world and in China especially was peaking. And so the Red Triad Mafia, you can look them up, they're an actual... <laughs> Chinese mafia group. I know it sounds like I'm making it this sounds up. like a Kung Fu movie, yeah. <laughs> but I have the actual whole article if, if anyone wants to see it. And yeah. um, and they they did a ton of things. They just illegally stole the seeds and things like that for replanting in China. And the climate in China is not right for maca to grow, and that's a whole other issue. Um, farmers yeah. were shot. Crops were stolen in the middle of the night or right out of the fields. You had guys driving up in trucks with bags of money and just being like, here, take all of this literal cash and give me your maca. And they just throw it in the back of the truck and drive away because you have yeah. a lot of people in Peru that are kind of th that are very poor. And so this sort of thing was very appealing, even though in the long term it was going to make their lives worse because they were going to take those things and replant them in China and they weren't going to buy the crop anymore. I mean, the yeah. saddest thing were some of the, the farmers and things like that getting shot. Finally, the Peruvian government had to send in the army to get rid of them. And and so it's not an issue anymore in this region? or Oh, it's it's still an issue, but they're not shooting the farmers. You know, that it, yeah. it's more of a black market sort of thing. It's less in the open now. But now that China is, I, I use the word growing in quotes because if people saw how they grew maca in Peru, you, you <laughs> um, yeah. but now that they're growing a lot of it there, they don't, they don't need as much. And that's why a short term cash is very appealing to the poor people in, in Peru. But in the long term, it creates less opportunity for them. Yeah. And I mean, this is something, you know, we've, we've dealt a lot with in Peru is the corruption within the market industry. Um, you know, we've seen 
the monopolies there, and I need to talk carefully when I talk about this because I don't want to upset anybody, but there is, you know, there is a hierarchy and there is a monopoly. And with all the, the big message that consumers need to be aware of is these types of superfoods, these types of, of foods that have just boomed over the last 10 years, they are all indigenous crops from small indigenous communities. They were probably never meant to be produced on this scale. And, you know, market in particular is a very, very sacred route that um, has a sacred history and it was used only in these small communities. Um, it was used a lot by sham shamans and healers and herbalists. Um, and suddenly the whole world, you know, they hear that it's great for menopause and libido. Um, and there's big money in that, you know, yes. um, particularly the libido effect. But you had what like you say, what happened where the Chinese came in and they took all the markup, the global price went through the roof. Mm -hmm. It, you know, it almost doubled in price in the space of a year. And this is because it, it takes, it's a 13 year production cycle. You know, it takes a year. Right. <laughs> yeah. If you want to do it right, it takes a year just to grow your crop. So we've, we've seen huge issues in the industry over there. There's also a monopoly of companies that process it and farmers oh. don't have the money to process for export themselves. So you get these cowboys out there going around rounding up market from farmers and price warring where you get, you know, they go to this farmer, they say, look, if you're not going to give me, you know, a dollar a kilo, I'm going to buy it from your neighbor. He's going to give me a dollar a kilo, you know, and, and they produce one crop a year. They have a, a suitcase of cash, like you were saying, and they'll pay, they'll, they'll sell. And, and six months later, they're out of money and they're, they're, they've screwed themselves. Um, but they're so desperate for the money. Mm -hmm. So these, these maqueros, they round it up, they take it down to the factories, they sell it into the factories, the factories manufacture, produce it for export. They then look for the, the companies, the export brokers, they sell into them, the export brokers search the globe and they email companies like us. I get emails two or three times a week. Hey, we have market at this price, this price, this price. You know, like the price, I look at the price and I go, it's not market. You can't be selling that as market. And, you know, they have these stockpiles in Lima and, and this is how we get it into our country. People say, well, you know, how do, how do I source market? They source us. They can't, they, they find us, you know, mm -hmm. um, and if you're a company that's only focused on money, then you, you're, you're going to love it because you're going to find cheaper supply uh, and you're going to be able to move more units and more volume and, and the market for, for these corporates, market market, they don't care. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and I mean, it's a really big issue, but um, what you're seeing now in the US is, you say 50% of market is Chinese. At least, it's probably, by next year, it'll probably be closer to 60%. I mean, we're at a, we're at, at least 50, wow. you know, so um, because <laughs> it's, it's cheap. I, I mean, who knows what's in it? it? It could be there. I mean, if you see pictures, and I can send people pictures if they want them, of like properly grown maca in the mountains in Peru and then what the maca looks like that they grow in China just by looking at the plant you yeah, can tell not, there is a, a no. significant it, yeah it looks like it looks more like a ginseng root and what's really scary about this is that when the market the Peruvian um academics tried to to prevent this this buy up of Chinese maca once they'd stolen the roots and the seeds uh, back into the in the global market to protect their own industries by scientifically researching it, and they showed that it it wasn't able to produce the macamides, which are the mm -hmm. the main bio ingredients. So they bought out all these studies saying like Chinese market is not the same as Peruvian market. But since then, the Chinese now have eight GMO patents on it, and their genetically modified forms are able to produce macamides. So they've gone that biotech way of GMOing their plants. GMO is banned in Peru. You can't GMO any crop in Peru. Whereas in China, there's no regulation around that. So it could even be organic marker. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem. Like we're, we've seen it now being spread all around the world. How do we know that it's GMO free? Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that we're seeing that's really scary because there are some people very vocal about Chinese marker out there like yourselves, people like us. They're now trans-shipping Chinese marker mm -hmm. via Peru to mm -hmm. overcome the 
pictures. So we've heard of factories being bought in Peru. <clears throat> Our farmers told us about this that are Chinese owned and run factories where they import Chinese marker all the way from China mm -hmm. and they process it, bag it, label it product of Peru to export it back out. And it's still mm -hmm. cheaper, much cheaper than Peruvian marker. And that has uh, to do with, uh, there's two parts to that. So intensive government subsidies, because like there was a thing a few years ago with vitamin C where they, where there was a price fixing scheme in China where the government just, paid vitamin C companies to just produce tons of it and they put everyone else out of business. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's that. And then China, because of certain trade treaties, pays basically nothing to ship products. So for it's cheaper for someone, for a company in China to ship something to the US using the US Postal Service than it is for me to ship something to Canada using the US Postal Service because of certain uh, trade negotiations. So there are a lot of, uh, and then also there's the use of slave labor. So if you don't pay someone to harvest anything, even 25 cents an hour, it's literal slave labor. You can produce things much cheaper. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it, it's a really, really big issue. I just wanted to show, um, I had a question here. Um, so I'm, we're going to go through a couple of questions. Um, so uh, Sharon, in, in response to your question, Josh, she said, can you send that chart to me? We're going to email you that chart of who owns who, but we're also going to email you the chart of which food producers own which food companies as well. Mm -hmm. um, we'll send that out. We've got your details and we'll, we'll also post it in the Facebook page. So that'll come out. Um, and then L, L here says, should consumers be boycotting Chinese organics? I'll, uh, Josh, I want you to answer this question. The, the, the answer is, when possible, yes, because there is no such thing as Chinese organics. And I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for saying that, but I don't care about making people mad. I know you you might, but I've never cared about that, which is why I'm not working for some <laughs> for a million dollars at one of those companies. Um, there isn't any such thing. There is simply... A, not enough people at the FDA to go and inspect the facilities in in China. There's not even close to the amount of money or physical people to do it. And so you can claim anything as Chinese organic, and it doesn't mean anything. Fake organic certificates are a massive problem in China. I can right now, if I wanted to, buy uh, a half a, buy three tons of or quote organic Chinese spinach and someone will certify it for me even if it was just regular spinach grown with all kinds of horrible chemicals and humid sewage and I can get my organic certificate. Okay. So yes, so it, it, you should boycott it because there's no such thing. And also the ethical side, I mean, the slave labor, the millions of people in concentration camps, the live harvesting of organs from the Falun Gong without any anesthesia. I mean, there are a million reasons that it, it should be boycotted. Okay. I think I think that's it's a comprehensive boycott. <laughs> but the, the other thing that I think is is more is very concerning is we can we can boycott Chinese organics, but we within our our knowledge, but we're still uh we're we're still at risk from things like trans shipping. We're still at risk from food labeling issues. Mm -hmm. This is where I think in New Zealand there's a huge problem because what we have now is a few organic companies controlling the market of what mm -hmm. comes into our, our country. And when we look at the seed and nut production of organics, it, pretty much everything that we have available in our stores is, is of Chinese origin. And this is really concerning because let's say out there I want to go buy a breakfast cereal. So I go out and I get mm -hmm. this organic muesli you know, made with superfoods and nuts and seeds. Where do you think all those nuts and seeds have come from? Mm -hmm. And all that says on the back of the label is produced from New Zealand and imported ingredients. Mm -hmm. The problem is the only place in the world to get cheap imported ingredients like that is from China. And consumers here are one of the problems because a lot of them don't want to pay for New Zealand growing or overseas growing organic, certified organics. Um, and a lot of them don't even know. So mm -hmm. it's not just about me saying I'm never eating Chinese pumpkin seeds again. 
I'm only going to buy New Zealand spray free or New Zealand certified organic pumpkin seeds. Mm -hmm. It's what, what, what happens when I go buy that muesli bar mm -hmm. or when I go buy the, that cereal blend, like, and it says imported ingredients. And, and it's really a, a worry because I've looked at so many companies and I write to them. I said, can you please tell me where these are sourced from? Mm -hmm. And they, they're very hesitant to tell you because they know that when you see the word China, you're going to be put off. Mm -hmm. And we, we already understand that here in New Zealand. But, you know, even my one of my favorite peanut butter companies recently, I asked about their pumpkin seeds and their Chinese origin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and this is this is something as consumers we need to be really aware of. I'm sure you have this in the U.S. as well with your food labeling issues. We do, and and so this is this is an issue that you can't. Not everyone has hours and hours every day to spend researching something. Nor do they know. <laughs> nor do can we expect everyone to know where to go to find this information or whether how to know if it's accurate or anything. Um, and that's why we kind of saved it for this webinar. So this will work for in the US. I don't know all the companies in New Zealand, but in the US and everyone who is on this webinar can get a copy emailed to them um, with access to it. We're going to put out an ethical and sustainable food guide. And it like, let's say you wanna know what brand of pasta to buy or what brand of canned beans or something like that, it will tell you which brands to buy. And we have an entire yep. guide that we're, re we're releasing this week so that it takes all of the research and the effort and makes it easy for people to do that. And it's gonna be updated because, you know, companies got bought out or they went bad or something. So everything in the guide will be free of any Chinese ingredients. So we are releasing that this week. And, you know, like I said, everyone on this webinar will get it for free. So we're trying to take the work out of it and make it a lot easier. And the thing is, it doesn't always have to be more expensive. That's yeah. kind of a myth um, perpetrated by a lot of these big corporations that if we, if, if we do things sustainably or we do things the right way, it'll be a lot more expensive. In, in some cases, it will be more expensive. In other cases, it won't. Uh, you know, pumpkin seeds, for example, don't have to be more expensive. I can get organic pumpkin seeds from the farmer in upstate New York, and it's the same price or a little bit less per pound than the Chinese pumpkin seeds at the health food store by me. So it yeah. doesn't it doesn't have to be more expensive. It, it will require some effort on the part of consumers, but also stores to put the effort in to source this. But we're making this guide and there's nothing that could stop a health food store from taking it and buying these products for their clients. And and this is really key. Like we're we're sort of we're jumping ahead because this is what we're going to talk about at Sorry. the end. Like we, I want I want a happy ending to this this discussion, and we'll come back to this um, at the end because we're going to talk about some some things that stores can do and that people can mm -hmm. do. I just wanted to answer. There was a question from um, Brigitte, Brigitte, Brigitte. Mm -hmm. Uh, she wanted to see some of the images, and I think she's referring to here the marker. Yeah, the uh, Chinese marker. Yeah, so I'm going to show you uh, here. Tell me if you guys can see this. Can you see that? Uh, not yet. There Does you go. Come? Yep. Yeah. So we have here on the left a fresh uh, Chinese growing maca root and on the right a Peruvian maca root. And on the, on the bottom, we have the dried roots, which is how it would be processed before it's consumed. So look at the symmetry and the shape of the Peruvian roots. This is a traditional root of how it's grown in Peru. And look at what the Chinese are producing on the left-hand side. And this was my thing, it, my point I was making. It doesn't even look like marker. It doesn't have the same biochemical profile as marker. It's very, very different. Um, and these roots... I think are the GMO roots that they've been producing. So they're now selling this uh, all around the world and they're starting to take that market off the Peruvians um, in many countries. And in the case of in the US and Australia now, we're seeing a lot of Chinese market where they can't get it in. What we're seeing is that trans shipping approach. Mm -hmm. um, which is happening where, you know, you're getting you're getting it shipped via via Peru. Uh, so it's quite scary. It's really quite scary. 
Um, I'm going to move on because I want to get through the, the rest of this. I want to talk about Amazon and online retail because I think this is something that's really shocking. We're lucky in New Zealand yet. We don't have Amazon here, thankfully. Um, but you, your experience with working with these online um, platforms, people say this is the future of retail. And we know in the U.S. you have an amazing online ordering and buying and you know. <laughs> service and all of these things that make life easier. So tell us about what you think Amazon has done for the industry uh, and what you think the problems are and the, what the future uh, holds <laughs> if we continue this route. That, so that's a, that's a big question. Uh, that's a lot, but I'll, <laughs> I'll do the best I can. I mean, one, you know, one thing Amazon did do that was good is they helped people understand that mail order and online ordering is a possibility. So they they were the ones that really pushed and developed that setting aside like the old Sears catalog and things like that. But, you know, Amazon was the one that kind of got this started. Now, whether that's good or, or a bad solution or whatever, the point is that it is here to stay. Like online mm -hmm. retail is not going away every year a, per, a higher and higher percentage of total buying in the u.s and around the world it more and more of it is done online so mm -hmm. it is happening you 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 know people can't just stick their head in the sand like like an ostrich or in you know in australia's case an emu and you know and pretend and pretend it's not they are evil and pretend it's not happening so, so, you know, one of the issues is that that is putting a lot of small businesses, you know, out of business. And so what I always tell small businesses about this is you, you have to accept that it's happening, but what do you do to adapt? And so mm -hmm. that is, so it's, it's kind of like evolution, survival of the fittest, you know, you have to adapt to survive. And there are a lot of things that small stores can do, but what they cannot do is continue to keep doing the same thing and think that the results are going to be different. It's like the story of uh, Kodak back in the, the 90s, you know, they said mm -hmm. it's all going to go digital and they said, no, people are still going to want analog. People mm -hmm. are still going to want to get those photos developed. They died, you know, mm -hmm. when Blockbuster died, when, when yeah. we went digital. Blockbuster I mean, had a chance to buy Netflix, actually. And they, yeah. they declined to do that. <laughs> yeah, they so, said no. People are still going to want to rent their DVDs and their, their, be, you know, yeah. So, so what is what does the Amazon model look like? T tell us about the ins and outs of Amazon. How have they got a a hold over this industry from a supplement perspective? I mean, they're your competition. You guys are an online retail store. Like, how do you, what have they well, done? Well, that's, that's that one of the things that I tell small stores. If you think of Amazon as your competition or one of those other large retailers, then, then you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to beat Amazon at Amazon's game. Like, there, there's a reason that Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world, and they're the largest online retailer, bigger than Walmart. You, you can't beat someone at a card game if they have all the cards and you have zero cards. It's just, it's not going to happen. So you, you, they're only your competition when you're trying to do the same things that they are doing. <clears throat> and, and so, you know, small stores, you know, and businesses have to realize that you cannot compete against Amazon. So why are you trying? It's like banging your head against the wall over and over again and wondering why you have a headache. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, what was really interesting, you were saying that they often, uh, anyone who uploads their products to Amazon, they track and trace what is popular. Mm -hmm. They know what's selling. And they even produce their own brands, their own labels. They will they will shift the market towards their interests all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, so companies often think, like, we've been told, why don't you guys sell on Amazon? And mm -hmm. I'm like... I, <laughs> Firstly, Bezos does not need any more money. <laughs> and secondly, all that we're doing is exposing the, our, the, you know, this to, to their, their, their daughter, their people. They're going to they're gonna understand 
the trends that are going to they're going to see what's moving and what's changing and they're they're changing the industry based on that information mm-hmm. you're exposing your brands to that you're you're buying into that big corporate model that's dominating the world at the moment there yeah. are there are several issues with it so a that one so if if a certain type of product is selling really well they'll come out with their own version of it under their label that looks the same in the pictures it doesn't have to be the same quality they'll price mm. it cheaper and they'll put their product at the top and on amazon whichever products are the top couple are what's going to get purchased you know the vast yeah. majority of the time and so your brand will get pushed out and so companies are sacrificing some short term are sacrificing their long term growth and survivability for short term profits a lot of companies now for example have to decide whether they give Amazon all of their inventory or they save some for other companies and and small mm-hmm. businesses. And one company, I'm not going to mention his name, it, it was a bar company, like a protein bar company. He ended up giving Amazon all of his inventory and so the stores weren't getting any. So the stores, you know, discontinued his product. Well, at one point he couldn't get a raw material, so his bars were out of stock for like 2 weeks or 3 weeks. Mm-hmm. Amazon came out with their own version, pushed his down, and he lost everything. He has no market now. And that is and- what is going to happen to a huge amount of companies because within 10 to 15 years, Amazon will be nearly entirely private labeled Amazon products or cheap Chinese knockoffs. And and yeah. you're starting to see that trend. And so un- unfortunately in the US with shareholders and the way companies look at things, we look at the very short term profit and, and long term that leads to many of the problems that we have <laughs> but but this is the corporate model and this is what i call the supermarket model <clears throat> so if i'm a, a superfood corporation what do i do i i source cheap materials overseas that are buzz words that are in that are big i get them as cheap as possible if i get a cheaper deal i jump on it i import them all here and i diversify my risk by importing multiple product ranges. I never go with a single product because a single product is stupid when, you know, if someone else competes within that field, you can lose your whole. So this is the issue with the protein. You shouldn't have had one protein bar. You should have done a whole range of sports nutritional products. Sure. This, this, and this is just talking about the corporate model. The second thing that I do is when I get these products in here, I need to move them as fast as possible because I only make a profit when that product sells. So the more units you move, the quicker. So you price reduce, you get the price down and you get it moving and flowing. Mm -hmm. You want supermarket deals because you know that this is the best and quickest and easiest way to get your product out there. But you realize as well, if you're a smart business, that the supermarket, if your products sell well, will produce knockoffs that will be cheaper than what you can produce. Mm-hmm. And the supermarkets will, and we've seen it in superfoods, all the superfoods that they've monitored over the last year or two years, suddenly bang, they bring out their own range. Mm-hmm. And guess what? It's cheaper than what yours is. Mm-hmm. And they're going to put it on the higher shelf position than yours. Yours is going to be down low. It'll stop selling. They'll stop using you. And now the, that supermarket's made money off your back. Mm-hmm. And and the problem is a lot of these companies then go back to the small independents and go, hey, remember us, we put our product on your shelf, but then we undercut you in the supermarket mm-hmm. and online and on all these online retailers. Well, they don't sell it anymore because they've got a better or cheaper version now of their own. Can you please sell our product again? You mm-hmm. know, And this is what we see. Like I, I feel for the small independents because they get sold on these ideas by their sales reps but they need to see the big picture of what's really going on. Mm -hmm. It's all about money. And if you're a smart business and you just want to make money, then that model works for you because by that point that you're no longer in that store, it's okay. You're on the next thing. Mm -hmm. You've jumped on the next train. You're following the trends. Mm -hmm. So we always say to people, you know, if if a superfood company that brings market to New Zealand ends up not being able to sell any more market because they've, they've squeezed it out of all the areas that they can, they don't care. They'll, they'll jump on hemp or yep. they'll jump on or Moringa or, or the next big thing, you know? Yeah. And, and um, yeah, I mean, Amazon, that model is really what Amazon is all about as well, but just in an online sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I, there's also the issue with Amazon is fraudulent products. So uh, products that are not 
at all what they say are knockoffs. I mean, I worked with, I did consulting for a company that was, that did not allow their products to be sold on Amazon because of counterfeit reasons. And then somehow yeah. some products with their labels on it ended up there. So they bought the product off Amazon and tested it. It was just talcum powder inside the pills. So there are tons of knockoff products. Then there's the issue of, um, climate control. So in Florida, for example, in the middle of the summer, a lot of those warehouse doors, Amazon warehouse doors are wide open and not food products really shouldn't be at very high heat and high temperature storage. Then the, then you get into issues where, for example, like let's say probiotics, for example, which many of them are temperature sensitive. Well, someone who lives in Phoenix um, where it's, uh, you know, the temperature of hell in the summer leaves that probiotic in their car and then mm. they send it back to Amazon. It just gets put on the shelf and sold to someone else. You know, like with our company, Root & Nutrition, if someone returns something, we don't resell it because we mm. can't guarantee how it was stored or, or, or things like that. So, um, you know, so there's issues with storage, with fraudulent products, with... Mm you know, there's with how they treat their employees, you know, that's also an issue. So there's a million reasons why I tell people you shouldn't buy anything that you're going to put in your body off Amazon. Um, I, I, a lot know, of people have heard of like Birkenstocks shoes, for example, they don't allow their shoes to be sold on Amazon because of how many counterfeit versions came out after they put them on there for a little while. Yeah. And this is, this is the thing. I think what with the with that whole Amazon thing, you know, like when I'm Googling or I'm looking for products, if I see anything on Amazon, I will use it sometimes as a research tool, but I will try and then buy direct from that company. Sure. I will try and find their website and buy direct because why should I give a percentage of my money towards Amazon mm -hmm. when that company c could be selling direct? And this is something mm -hmm. consumers really need to be aware of. When a lot of online retail stores will take 30 to 40% of the profit, you know, and, and, and that money really needs to go to the little, the little guy, the little supplier, mm -hmm. the armor, the people behind it. So it's, it's a simplicity really is a danger because mm -hmm. simplicity is what makes us complacent. And as you know, we see it here with stores too. They, they often say, ah, oh, I can, this one uh, broker or this one sales rep can supply me with 40 different products. Mm -hmm. I don't need, I want my life to be simple. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the idea of going out and sourcing 40 different suppliers for a little company is that's part of the problem. You know, well, they want I can, I can definitely speak to that. It would be much easier for me to use a distributor like UNFI or select nutrition than and get everything than to order maca from, you guys and seaweed from Ireland and spirulina from a farmer in New Mexico. And, yeah. you know, it would be, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of stores do it. And then also there's volume discounts that get applied. Um, uh -huh. You know, like Whole Foods in the US isn't accepting new products that aren't in certain distributors because they get this massive discount. So that, mm. yeah, and Whole Foods is not like they mark the prices down. So they're squeezing the people. So they have to decide, do we put it on the shelves at all? Or do we take less margin? And in the end, it's the farmer or the harvester or the laborer that always gets screwed over. I mean, Whole but, Foods, which has this image, was having cheese made from prison labor for a while. I, I mean, there's all of this stuff that that goes on that is a huge problem problem because it because of the corporate model it doesn't have to be that way but that's the way that most places have chosen so so how many products do you stock on your website at the moment i think we have close to 700 <laughs> and, and so you have 700 suppliers no because yeah, some of them do no we don't have 700 suppliers but most of the suppliers that we have, except for like two or three, specialize in certain things. Yeah. Like you guys specialize in maca, the seaweed people mm -hmm. from Ireland, they just harvest seaweed in the same way they always did. The bee people, the beehive people in New York, you know, we get royal jelly and honey and bee pollen from that farm. Uh, a man by the name of Dr. Cowan 
uh, specializes in vegetable powders that he buys from farms, some right near me that I visited. So we tend to stick with companies that specialize in one thing more so than try and make everything because no company can do that. I know they like to, but you can't do everything. Yeah. <laughs> you can. And, and, well. uh, that that brings us to the, 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 the summary really at the end that we want to talk about before we wrap up is, you know, with some of these grim realities of where everything is heading, um, corporate monopolies, all of these issues about the capitalist model, the corporate model, what what can we do? Like, what is the future? Tell us, I'm an I'm a small business. What do I do to compete? I'm if I'm an online retailer, what do I do to compete? If I'm a supplier, what do I do? Like, what does the future look like that's that allows us to keep control of what we put in our bodies and what we uh, you know, our, our organic industry, our supplement industry. So it, it's definitely going to take a, a massive educational effort. But for example, specialization is w what you need to do. Your small companies are not going to beat large companies trying to make everything. It's it's never mm -hmm. going to happen. And, and companies need to stop trying and they just keep failing. You know, so specializing in something is good. You know, a small health food store should stop trying to be a grocery store slash vitamin center slash everything for for everyone because they're selling the same products that they can get online or at the grocery store down the road for much cheaper. You you can't sell the exact same product, same brand, everything for two dollars more on a loaf of bread and think people are just gonna come to you for what reason? You know, that's just not the way it is anymore. What they should be doing is partnering with small independent local producers near them. And there are ways like going to farmers markets to finding them. They should be working with companies that aren't big in supermarkets. And if there's a supermarket mm -hmm. down the road from them, they can go there and see what brands are there. Uh, to yeah. give one example, the, the big names, and I'm going to use something basic, frozen fruits and vegetables. The big names out there are Cascadian Farms, Earthbound, and Woodstock Farms in the U.S. They are, Cascadian Farms, for example, is owned by General Mills. They're just big, generic frozen vegetable packers. But there's a company in Oregon or Washington, I always get it confused, called Stallbush Farms. They're family owned. They grow everything on their own farms. The farm waste goes to power their electricity needs. They um, they don't get anything from China or everywhere else like like all the other companies do. And they grow things truly sustainably. They truly work on the soil. You know, it, it's a real what people think of as organic. They use this paper bag packaging instead of plastic packaging, and stores, that would be my first switch. Switch out your Cascadian Farms frozen vegetables for these established ones. The price is basically the same. And then do a tasting. If you put out, and this goes back to kind of the picture of that you had of the Chinese maca versus the real Peruvian maca. If mm. you put out a little cup of those established farm frozen blueberries, and then a little cup of the Cascadian or General Mills ones, the look is completely different and the taste is completely different. And so you let people taste those. You put up a flyer on the freezer that says why you're switching and you put up little note cards in your own words, not provided by a company of why you're doing this and why this company is mm -hmm. better. You have to educate people. You mm -hmm. can't just throw it in there and expect magic to happen, but those are two simple things. But the other thing is, and then you do that with all the different products in your store. And I'm happy yeah. to provide any health food store with a list of these brands that aren't big in supermarkets. And I've done all this work and I'm happy to give it to people. The other thing is there you're going to have to build a website and, and you're going to have to have an online store. Now, you're not going to be shipping frozen vegetables and things like that. But anything that's not a grocery staple, you're going to need to sell online and you're going to need to tell your customers you sell online. Because to be frank, you know, with the pandemic and things like that, things are changing. You must have an online presence. You're going to have to write articles, but write how you're doing these ethical things, write how you're doing about what you're doing with these small brands, you know, do all of this 
And people will be loyal and they'll shop there because you're giving them an experience and a destination and something different. But you cannot continue to sell the exact same products for more money that you can get at the grocery store. It's not going to work. Can you, it, I, you know, and that is the message that I think every small organic store needs to hear because when we've traveled around New Zealand, and this is the thing, like, I don't know whether it's, sometimes it's laziness or sometimes it's, 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 you know, a lack of time, a lack of resources, but you see this, the, mo the model is where the people are struggling, they've done everything that you have said not to do, mm -hmm. where they're, they've had simplicity of buying everything through one one company, one person. I, if I was a, a small store owner, the first thing I would say when a rep comes in trying to sell me something is give me a list of stores where you stock. And if any of those stores are anywhere in your area, within a supermarket or anywhere, I would not touch them with a 10 foot pole. And, and you know, like firstly, I think as well, we need more small companies out there specializing. That's, that's the first thing. In, in New Zealand, there are still gaps in our organic sector. Um, you know, but secondly as well, suppliers need to become part of this model. Mm -hmm. And as a supplier, we really dedicate ourselves to supporting our stockists. We have 130 stockists here in New Zealand. They get so they, you know, we run in-store tastings, we run workshops, mm -hmm. we run webinars, we run informational sessions. You know, it's really about saying like, if you're going to work with us, we're a partnership. Mm -hmm. You win, we win. And there's no way in hell we're going to go put our products in the supermarket next to you and sell it cheaper. We don't sell in supermarkets. We don't sell in online retail stores. If you stock our product in store, we're happy for you to put it on your website. And we set a price minimum so that people don't undercut each other. The and if you're going to try and undercut someone else, then we don't want you to be stocking our product. Like it's a fair, even playing field, you know? Yeah, and um, there, and when stores and people support these smaller companies, that money <clears throat> stays in the community and helps the the people. When when you give money to General Mills that in, that imported you know spinach from China, none of that money benefited the community or or the area. Whereas when you buy spinach from Stallbush Farms you know, you, you benefited that area, they, they pay their workers well, you know, and then that money gets spent and, and so forth and so forth. So, you know, sourcing these little local companies, going to the farmer's market and seeing that person who sells cheddar cheese and be like, I want to sell your cheddar cheese at my store instead of the brand you're mm. selling. That is the kind of things that, that stores need to do. It, it does require some effort and some change, but it's that, or they're going to go the way of the dinosaur do dodo birds. You, you people, you have to adapt. Yeah, and it. I mean, beyond that idea. So the, you were saying that we, you know people need to go out and they need to find these. Let's say in my store, I want to stock um, breakfast cereals, or I want to stock, um, you know, different nuts or seeds. They need to go out and find all of those suppliers mm -hmm. themselves. Like they need to have a, st I think every product should have a story mm -hmm. and it should be showcased. Mm -hmm. So do you think in your experience, having less products with more meaning behind them is better than having a bigger range? Yeah. I mean, you don't need like 10 brands of, of spirulina. A, seven or eight of those are the same thing from the same raw material repackaged by seven companies. Yeah. You should have, you know, a couple options like with spirulina, have like a powdered version and a capsule version and tell the stories of those and why they're they're different instead of the identical to the 90 percent of other spirulina. So you don't need nine me too products. It, it would be much better for an independent to have these unique products. And so then people are getting better products people are getting healthy, the smaller stores are surviving and, and doing well, and then the farmers and the harvesters and the laborers are also being paid a fair wage. So all of those things come into effect just from a simple purchase. When, for example, when I 
buy spirulina wild harvested off the coast of Ireland by a family that's been doing it forever and is very different than when it's grown in a polluted pond in China. You know, the, mm. the difference for the environment and for your health, not just the survival of a store, is is just insane. I mean, we do tastings with mushrooms and all these things. And when things are grown right and, and grown properly, it's an incredible difference. So these tastings are, are really important, but you have to have flyers. It, it's a lot of work that stores will need to put in. But that's your that's a choice. There's really only two options at this point. Yeah, and and what do you say about the in terms of online? Like we get we get asked this sometimes. We get customers saying, "Do I buy direct from you or do I buy in my local store?" Mm -hmm. I always say, you know, if you really want to be fair, buy one time from us and one time from the store, mm -hmm. because without the store, we don't exist. Sure. But also, you know, like you want to share, you want to be supporting directly to these these things. So how 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 do you think it's best to balance that from a consumer perspective of supporting local stores, but also supporting companies and suppliers? From like a consumer perspective, what I think is best, and we might have a slight difference here, is that find that ethical company and then buy it however it's easiest and best for you. That's that's my view of it because that company is getting supported and you're getting the good product and the consumer is more apt to do it if it's easier for them. So whatever way is easiest for them or more convenient for them or will just get them to buy that Stalbush spinach grown in Oregon or Washington instead of that Chinese spinach, However, they're going to do that. I'm for because in the long run, that's the, what makes the most difference and what builds a, a better world. And is there a rule of thumb when it comes to companies to align with? So your model is that we select a specialized company for every product. Like, Almost. is there a rule? Of thumb? Like, how do we how do we stop <laughs> how do we stop greenwashing? You know, because greenwashing is a huge issue in our industry. And I have so many conversations with people that say, oh, no, no, no. I already, I the one I buy is organic. Mm -hmm. You know, they use, companies use buzzwords, organic, ethical, sustainable. Like, mm -hmm. how do we filter our way through that from a consumer? I'm a consumer. I don't know anything about marker. How do I know what is a good marker? Like, what, what, what would be your advice on that? Like, can I trust websites? Can I trust, you know, like product reviews like where is where do i get this so information you should definitely never ever 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 trust online product reviews i can go online right now and hire a company to give me 1000 five star ratings for about a couple hundred bucks and it'll be done yeah. in a few hours so a never trust online reviews the vast majority of them are fake so you know i mean you could tell the one that's real it's the one guy that was clearly a jerk and assaulted the staff and is complaining that they punched him back after he kicked him in the face. You know, you can tell that one's real, but yeah. for the most part, most reviews are faked or by friends, you know, it, it's just, you should never go by online reviews. And this is one of the issues because people are always like, well, is there one place I could go? Is there one place I can look? And, and the truth is that there, that there isn't. And that's scary for a lot of a lot of people. Where you would get good information about herbs is is different than where you would get good information about what brand of salmon to buy. So that's why we're making this shopping guide for people because I couldn't come up with a good answer that didn't involve you spending eighteen hours reading about salmon fishing. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have stock in any of these companies. We have not been paid by any of them. We've not taken one cent. And if you and if people want the methodology about how we looked into a company and how we put it in the shopping guide, we'll give that to you. We'll give you the sources on that company. I mean, one of the things you mentioned Moringa not that long ago. We, I had a company because we were looking to source Moringa that said they had the most amazing Moringa. They emailed me pictures of the farm, an interview with the farmer, you know, all of this stuff. It was all 100% fake. It was actually just tons of it coming from China and they made the farm and the story and everything up. 
So, so how? Do, but this is what I mean. Like if you go to a website and you see, hey, our 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 marker, our moringa is ethical. It's sustainable. We work directly with farms. We hear that all the time. Our competitors, our corporate competitors, say we work directly with farms. They don't work with farms. Like so, how do as a consumer, how do I get through all of that? Well, like, that that's I, the oh, that chat, what, like what do I do? Well, that's the problem. So I only found out that that company is lying is because we pay a lot of many, money every month where I can see the import certificates that companies have. So I can see where, mm -hmm. so I pay for that. Mm -hmm. But not every customer is going to, not every uh, person is is going to want to spend 500 to $2,000 a month looking at on import certificates. Like that's not realistic to ask people to do. And so there are some good organizations where you can get good information from. Um, cornucopia.org, for example, is a really good mm -hmm. one for the U.S. And you can see like they have a dairy scorecard and an egg scorecard. And you can see the companies that that are doing things right. And, and they're not bought off. But there are, for example, organizations. There's the Organic Consumers Association, which is a really good organization in the US and then there's another organization that sounds very similar to it that's just an industry greenwashing front group so there are yeah. good organizations but it can be very hard to tell and and that's kind of the goal of the the shopping guide is to take all of that work out but then if someone wants to do that digging in the shopping guide we put ways so they can learn to do it for themselves so we yeah. are putting that information out so that people have the ability to do it if they want. They have it done for them, or they may be curious and they may want to read 18 hours about the ethics of line versus net caught salmon fishing and all that. And we, and so we are making all that information available because I couldn't find another way to do it. People, if you didn't go to college to read a clinical trial, you can make an abstract uh, say whatever you want it to say, you know, the difference between a yeah. test tube and a cell culture and a rat study and a human study. So what we were trying to do with the shopping guide is to do that work for people, but have it be transparent so they could see. And also there's no advertisements in it and we're not taking money from anyone. We've been offered money from companies. Oh, can you put our coupon in here or something, you know, we'll give yeah. you a bunch of money. But the answer had to be no because the first word is ethical yeah. and sustainable yeah. shopping guide. And if we're taking advertising money, that couldn't be. But that's why you can only download it. I'm not printing and mailing a million copies. People will be able to go to the website and download it on their phone. You know, so we, um, so. we really need something like this in New Zealand. Like I was, I've always said to you, can you bring Rooted Nutrition to New Zealand? Because I feel like our online retail stores here you know, they, they have some stores that say, oh, we're all about New Zealand made. Um, but then they're selling in a lot of imported products. And it's like, well, just because a New Zealand company is owned by New Zealanders doesn't mean that it's, you know yeah. what I mean? And so these are these are the problems. Like we there needs to be uh, uh, places where you can go to get to get all this information I, as a from a company perspective one of the ways that we've tried to build um confidence with our consumers of what we're doing is what we say we're doing i think the ultimate was saying we'll come to peru with us mm -hmm. and you know, we invite consumers to come and be part of the journey harvest mm -hmm. the market yourselves and i think that's taking it to another level mm -hmm. you know and I would say that to anyone producing here in New Zealand, offer that as a thing. Once a year, come come work with us. Come I have, our, I have visited a lot of the farms and places that we get products from. I've met the farmers. I've shook their hand. I went to India and ate turmeric out of the field and then followed that same batch back to the U.S. You know, to have it processed at the facility. So... I don't just trust. I've had to visit a lot of a lot of places, and you know, I've been to the farm where we get the royal jelly and the bee pollen, and I've, you know, met their kids and had dinner with their family. You know, these are, and so that's the only way, like you said, to to truly know. And and 
it, it is a great model. Not every company is gonna gonna go for that, but it is a great model for sure but for I would, companies that yeah. can do it. Yeah, I would definitely encourage any if you're a single product company, the more transparency you can offer around that, the better. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say to consumers, skepticism around anybody else, you know, like always be skeptical. We need mm -hmm. more people to ask more questions. And it's up to the suppliers and the producers um, to create that transparency around what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, the last point I wanted to make was about Google. Mm -hmm. uh, before we wrap up, and this is the frustration about where do I find this information? When we started out, we weren't even on Google. Mm -hmm. We were page 20 of Google. So people said, I can never find, how do you, how did I know you existed? You know, and it's really hard when you're little to try and work your way up the Google rankings. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, we've spent a lot of time and effort. We've had a lot of people volunteer their time to help us with SEO and to help us with all this and that. But that's a really big issue too, that I think needs to be addressed is how do little businesses, like, how do you, how do I know that I'm to get spirulina from Ireland? Do you know, like, <laughs> you, 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 well, you, you can either nerd out pretty hard. Um, yeah. Like, like how many days did that take you on Google to find? I'm, I'm embarrassed to say how long some of these things took me to, you know, they say to become an expert at something, it takes 10,000 hours. Yeah. And if I told you the amount of days and events I've missed and, and, you know, it's it's an incredible amount of work and that's why i don't think it's feasible or right to expect the average person to to do that like for example i mean is the average person going to know that you have to make sure that the spirulina is is doesn't have high levels of microcystin a kidney toxin even if the farmer and the place harvesting it is super ethical if they harvest it at the wrong time or at the wrong stage that can happen. So they meant well, and, and the product mm -hmm. may seem ethically harvested and well-made, but then there's that quality issue. You can't separate the two, the kind of ethics and quality have to go together, but you, you cannot expect people to learn about that. I mean, let's say someone called me and they wanted to know everything about spirulina. I can guarantee within 15 minutes, their eyes would be glazed over when I started talking about the various compounds in spirulina. So we can't, we can't really expect people to do that. It's, yeah. we have to be realistic. I think, I think continued education from consumers is really important. You know, like we've, we've spent three years here in New Zealand, we've run over 350 workshops, some of them to two, four, three, you know, three, four people, mm -hmm. some of them to 75, a hundred people. And really, that's all we can do is just continue to increase that knowledge and education. Mm -hmm. uh, as a as a company, when we launched, we did surveys of, of consumers and no one knew anything. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for stores to be helping get that education out there. Um, people going attend workshops, um, learn about fermenting, learn about bone broths, learn mm -hmm. about you know, all of this stuff. So as a store, like that's a really big value add that you can bring is having an educational program linked. Get your get your regular customers to come in and ask your suppliers to provide this. Mm -hmm. You know, if, well, you, you, you have know. to be you have to be careful choosing what suppliers you let do that. Yeah, because yeah. they will. Yeah. Uh, Don't the big guys in, but you know. It's, it's, <laughs> Um, it, it, yeah. You know, the other thing is that store staff have to be more educated and better taken care of. You, you like in the U.S. at a lot of health food stores, someone might be making nine dollars an hour. You can't expect them to be spend all this time researching and be incredibly knowledgeable when you give them no benefits and, and nine dollars an hour. That's mm -hmm. not. You have to invest in in people as well. I mean, I know health food stores where the owners were taking home a million dollars a year after taxes and paying their employees $9 an hour. Like they're thinking short term, if they paid that guy $20 an hour, they could probably have taken home 1.2 million because of the, the more money that guy would have made them. But because they were so short term in their thinking, they have massive turnover and it's very hard you know, and they think you can just drop people in. Well, yeah, you can. Any, you know, most people can stock a shelf, but that doesn't mean 
they're going to be passionate or, or care. And, and you yeah. also have to put people in the right department. If, if Bob is passionate about the mold that grows on different cheeses from the different regions they're in, but you have uh, Bob stock in the freezer, stick Bob in the cheese section. Like you, you ask people what they're passionate about. Yeah. You know, you, and you know, <laughs> that's part of the development, I suppose, within a, a store. But I think, you know, the, to do with those systems and that structure is really essential. Um, I really like the idea though, of like, learn more about your products, about your suppliers. Mm -hmm. Um, and, if you, you know, like if you have somebody out there doing something that you think is interesting, you know, like I, like you say, like if we have, we're getting spirulina from this local spirulina farm and we find that really fascinating what you guys are doing, come and present it in our there store. There is actually an incredible spirulina farm not far from you. Yeah. Making yeah, we know incredible Tuck. spirulina. We, we, we're a good friend. The guys from Tahi up in Himatanga, I think Himatanga Beach, it's like two hours from here. Mm -hmm. um, and great company, family business. They do amazing they spirulina. Use French model. Um, he, he went to France to learn that. Yeah. So exactly. And, you know, like those are the things I think little businesses can do. Try and push your suppliers to help support you on that model. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think you've given some really awesome insights. And um, I'll just say, if anyone's still uh, there, if you have any last questions, please type them in now in the question section and we can answer anything. And, um, and then on our website, we're adding one to two pages of new con referenced content every week for free. You don't have to put your email in. You don't have to give us your information. We don't spam you. And you can learn about the history of this stuff, how it's made, the testing, there's videos, and we don't charge for any of it. And every week we add one to two more pages. And so the goal is to give people a place where they don't have to pay and they can get the information and they can click through and see the references for themselves. So I've just put in the chat box here, your web address is uh, joshbouton.com. Mm -hmm. Is that the right one? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the page for Rooted Nutrition in the U.S., um, and there's some really great information on there on the information centers. There's info about cacao, about maca, uh, about your manuka honey, uh, mushrooms, pregnancy, the whole food center. Yeah. We're adding more stuff all the time because we want people to have a place to go. So it'll, you know, it's going to grow as we add more pages and it's completely free it, and, and you really don't have to put your information in, which is very, very different than everywhere else. Yeah, awesome. And and um, cool. So Zara said this has been really great info. I've not thought about this before. That's exactly what we want to hear. <laughs> we need people to just become more aware and start to think as conscious consumers. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank you for your time. Uh, I always really enjoy um, chatting with you and hearing your insights. Um, it gives me hope that you know, that we have uh, a, a world out there where people have the right intentions and the right business structure and approach that we can actually bring change to this industry. Um, and so, yeah, thank you so much sure. for your time. Uh, what we're going to do is email out to you guys a few links. I'll put it in the Facebook page as well. Uh, and we will... Um, this will be converted into uh, downloaded and converted into a YouTube video with time points too. So if you get, if you don't want to listen to the whole thing and you just want to remember a few little bits and pieces um, by mid next week, I'm going to time point it by questions and answers. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for tuning in. You can rewatch this at any point by clicking on the webinar link that you were sent when you registered. Um, and if you have any more questions too, you're welcome to email uh, us at selenohealth.com. So info at selenohealth.com or Josh, what's your email, Josh? I put it in the chat there. So, you know. In the uh, chat. So Josh at joshbouton.com. Mm -hmm. And cool. we'll be doing more webinars in the future. We'll be a little more focused. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. We're going to have some more coming up. I want to delve a lot more deep into some of these topics and, uh, there's so much more that we can talk about as well, but it's really all at the end of the day about empowering people to make the right decisions for their health 
uh, and the health of their families out there. So thank you so much, Josh. Thanks for um, having me. And if also, if you guys want to buy any of our marker, buy through the Rooted Nutrition website. So you guys are now our, our main supplier in the U.S. Um, and yeah, and we really appreciate your time. So we'll uh, we'll chat soon. See you, Josh. Bye.